Okay, I'm going to hand over to Chalani and Fezun, who are going to do a joint presentation. They have 15 minutes, um, as, as there's um, two of the minutes, and it's a joint presentation. So I'm not giving leeway to the ladies, just in case any of the men in the room would like to accuse me of that. Okay, over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I would also like to thank uh, Mariamie and Mariam uh, and the organizers uh, for working so hard to bring us here. Um, as the title of this presentation, we are going to talk about uh, ethno-religious nationalism in Sri Lanka. And I'm going to start with 2009, when the long civil war in Sri Lanka ended. Uh, as many of you may know, with the victory for the Sri Lankan state and the defeat of the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam. Now, the war itself could be seen as a consequence of nationalism and the result of the refusal of successive post-colonial governments to share political power with the minority Tamils. Uh, at the end of the war, many Sri Lankans uh, saw it as the defeat of one of the biggest threats to Sinhala Buddhism and Sinhala Buddhists who comprise about 75% of the population. From the foundation of what is now considered a historic victory, the government is seeking to consolidate the dominance of Sinhala Buddhist identity. And this new identity is based on a refusal to recognize minority identities. Uh, it is based on the valorization of the military and the military victory and deepening militarization. It is based on a binary construction of patriots and traitors and the lack of tolerance for all dissent and the projection of neoliberal economic development as a solution to all our problems. And of course, the redefinition of gender roles and gender identities. I'm sorry, I think I'm supposed to be clicking, yes. Maybe you can go there. Yeah, so this context has given rise um, to various extremist Sinhala Buddhist groups, and one which we are going to focus on here is called the Bodhubala Sena, who is waging now a different kind of war. Uh, Bodhubala Sena translates roughly as Buddhist power army or Buddhist power force, and Faizun is going to talk a bit more about them. Thank you. Uh, Chu, can you just. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, the Sinhala uh, Buddhist nationalism is, and then this uh, BB, BBS is Buddhist force. That is how it translates. Uh, it is no more on the fringe, but it is firmly entrenched in mainstream politics. And the deep rooted perceptions that Muslims will endanger the Sinhala ethnic. Also, the polit political elites are using these tensions to gain political power and benefits. Uh, BBS is merely not an organization, but it represents a state of mind within the state. And some analysts also see very clearly that the BBS, uh, the ayatollahs, ayatollahs, and the cultural police. So what I can, uh, these are, uh, since, uh, uh, since 2009, there was collective violence that was escalating. Attacks, uh, not only Muslims, but also Christians, human rights, uh, civil society organizations, but recently, we, against Muslims, it was systematic intimidation threats targeting uh, mosques, shops, business enterprises. And in 2000, uh, 2014, June, was this uh, attack. Uh, actually, um, uh, together with the kind of uh, direct attacks, there is violence and hate campaign in the social media also, which is continuing. Um, in, in the 2000, can we, uh, the, I'm, I'm just uh, running to the next. Uh, oh, 
Okay. The, the claims of BBS is, I think, important to mention here. Uh, there are uh, two or three which I would uh, mention here which will be useful. One is the whole um, halal certification on food. I mean, uh, the, the, the charge is that the authority is with the all Ceylon Jamiat ulama which is um, earning more than $5 million every year on this whole certification process. So what the BBS is saying is that this is an attempt by Muslims to impose their ways and their God, and that it is part of a larger plot to control and monopolize market unfairly, because in fact, they are f uh, forcing Sinhala uh, consumers to subsidize Muslim religious activities and f through that funding their extremism. And they have also very directly mentioned that channeling funds uh, to Al-Qaeda, to Hamas, to and all the jihadis. Uh, the other one which I would like, and, and the other charge is that uh, Arabization of the Sri Lankan Muslims and that the Muslims' real uh, home is the Middle East. And uh, the Sinhalese have given them a little bit of freedom. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, uh, through their generosity that the Muslims are able to live here. And that the uh, Muslims have growing economic cultural ties uh, to Middle East. And uh, uh, increasing Islamic practices, which is pronounced and more visible the last 10 years. And the other charge is the whole expansion uh, that the Sinhala Buddhists uh, comprise 78% of the Sinhala and Muslims is 9% today. And that uh, Muslims will outnumber the Sinhala population. And uh, you know the, the, that they will have, because they continue to have polygamy and they don't practice family planning. So the, the majority uh, displays uh, a minority insecurity complex in the face of this popular uh, explosion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other preoccupation of the BBS has been with women. So among 10 commandments which they adopted in 2012, two relate to women. One is the opposition to sending Sri Lankan women migrant workers to the Gulf, where they allege that they are being converted to Islam. And two is the opposition to certain birth control methods. They have charged that the government policy on family planning have rendered over 800,000 Sinhalese women infertile. They're also charging that certain Muslim uh, business establishments are actively attempting to reduce the Sinhala population through various means. Uh, now, this discourse is perfectly complemented by the regime's own construction of women as mothers and wives within an overarching familial ideology, where they believe that women are supposed to provide a solid foundation to the family as well as to society by devoting their life to raise children, manage the family budget, and ensure peace within the family. The implications for women's equality of these two discourses coming together are manifold, but I will just give two examples. Uh, I think that's okay. <laughs> Let me just do that. Okay. Um, the first, again, relates to migrant women. So Sri Lanka has long been a remittance economy depending on migrant workers uh, for foreign currency. Uh, in 2000, about 75% of Sri Lanka's migrant workers were women. However, reducing the number of women, especially married women, going abroad for work has become a key government policy goal. While no legal prohibition is um, yet in place, the government has made it very difficult for women, particularly those with children under the age of five, from migrating abroad for work. A new circular issued by the Ministry of Foreign Employment in 2013 requires prospective workers to satisfy two conditions. First, provide evidence of family background and proof of adequate childcare arrangements, and then two, to secure a no-objection certificate from their husbands. A fundamental rights petition, which was filed by a migrant worker, 
uh, was dismissed by the Supreme Court. The second relates to uh, the pushback in relation to family planning and reproductive rights, where women are now being constructed as bi biological reproducers of the nation. To begin, in September 2007, the government closed down all abortion clinics, uh, which had been allowed to function in Sri Lanka for decades, even though abortion is a crime under the law. Um, and then in March 2013, following protests against family planning organized by the likes of the BBS, uh, the Ministry of Health also sent a circular to government hospitals and private institutions from providing all irreversible birth control methods uh, while also banning NGOs from the provision of sterilization services. Now, why this is so significant is because Sri Lanka's family planning policy goes back to the 1950s. A popular campaign run by the government in the 1980s went by the name Small Families Are Like Gold. As a result, Sri Lanka's fertility rates uh, have been uh, uh, very low. So this narrative of imminent extinction has also given rise to incentives that are being offered both by the state and non-state actors for larger Sinhala families. Um, because uh, one of them uh, is implemented uh, by the government, offers rupees 100,000 ru uh, to uh, cash benefits uh, to the police and to the army who have uh, a third child. Since the military and the police are overwhelming in Sinhalese, this is clearly a way to increase uh, the Sinhala population. Conversely, there are also reports that minority Muslim women are being forced to use birth control. Now, however, Sinhala Buddhist nationalism is not new. The post-colonial history of Sri Lanka is a history of the state increasingly identifying with Buddhism. In, it, uh, in fact, it was the 1972 constitution which first gave foremost place to Buddhism. Before and after that, we've had many laws and policies which have privileged the majority community and discriminated against the minority. Uh, the first, actually the first riots against Muslims goes back to 1915. Uh, and perhaps the most well-known is uh, the pogrom against Tamils in 1983, which pre precipitated the war. The articulation of gender within nationalist discourse is also not new. Um, many scholars have pointed out about the elaborate construction of a good Sinhala Buddhist woman in national, uh, nationalist ideology. So I think... Um, it's not wrong to say that public policy with regard to women, however, has remained gender neutral even as the state became ethnicized over the years. Uh, and Sri Lanka's positive indicators for women uh, or in a way um, reflects this. And I guess what I'm saying is now we are uh, confronted with the racism and the sexism of the state, uh, which is a new phenomenon. Uh -huh. And there are also some other elements which are new. One is the way the BBS is um, working hand in glove with the state, I think which is quite unprecedented. And then the complicity of the police and other uh, institutions of government. Uh, second is the role of the diaspora in the support of the BBS and uh, the regime. And third is the alliance that the BBS is making with other Sinhala Buddhist extremists. Recently, they invited Achin Virindu, the leader of the 969 in Burma, uh, to attend their convention. And at the convention, they adopted this MOU, uh, ironically, although the irony would be lost on them, where a key goal is to build a, a peaceful uh, world without fundamentalism and extremism. But the more ominous part of this MOU was the fact that they also conceptualized it in terms of a, a, pli uh, a declaration on Buddhist uh, international. Uh, so I think, but all of this is not to also deny Muslim fundamentalism in Sri Lanka, and I think Faizun would uh, maybe close with some. Yeah, uh, uh, the challenge is actually foiling uh, Muslim extremism, fundamentalism, giving prominence and power to mobilize themselves uh, in this kind of political environment. Uh, 
um, because uh, the, the trend of ethnicity-based mobilization creates and aggravates vertical divisions between different identities. And it is also easy to mobilize people on the basis of addressing the collective emotions of these people, both Sinhala and Muslims. In fact, BBS is a good ally of the Muslim extremism fundamentalisms in the larger political picture of promoting right-wing movement agendas because although they both show they have competing claims, I mean, there, there are meeting points and also, you know, uh, separation. The other point is dress code and national security discourse because um, BBS is promoting and pushing Muslim women to take out their Islamic attire, abaya, niqab, which is also now being quite prominent, which was not there before. So they claim that this is a threat to national security. Um, and they are using this, the, the Muslims are using this to mobilize and further uh, their fundamentalist uh, goals. Because today there are um, more than 50 uh, Muslim extremist factions are there. I mean, repackaging their own ideologies uh, uh, through the influence of Wahhabis. So I think we should uh, uh, critique both kinds of trends and contesting ideologies. Uh, national security vis-a-vis -vis personal security. Who determines parameters of peace and security? Is it essentially the state or non-state or community or individual women and men? So who is going to protect citizens and affected people? So what is important is the distinction of state as a guarantee of equality before the law and the state as an instrument of the majority community which can refuse full equal and civil and political rights to minority communities. It also raises the legitimacy of the state itself. So in, uh, if we extend this further, submerging individual multiple identities into an overarching ethnic identity and culture creates serious issues for the individual, especially for women. Uh, on their mor moral autonomy, human rights, as it reinforces political, uh, patriarchal and authoritarian uh, eth uh, authoritarianism within the community. So as activists, we are trying to develop a new culture, a political culture and vision that transcends the majority and minority complex. And pigeon holding you know, people into seri uh, cultural stereotyping. And what we need is a political culture that is citizen-led, demanding justice and meaningful democratic governance. So we strongly be believe that there is strength in our collective struggle and solidarity to push our agendas. Thank you. Thank you, both of you, and you did get an extra minute and a half. <laughs>